This is Mark. Hello, Mark. This is Nick. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Uh, audio all good? You can see me just fine? Uh, yep. Everything's good. All right. Perfect. Um, how are you doing? How's your day been? Uh, not bad. Still recovering a little bit from the Dallas conference, but other than that, hanging in there. How'd that go? Because I would have made it if it wasn't in, in Dallas. <laughs> Uh, it went great. Um, uh, wonderful speakers, great media, uh, interesting drama. Not not too not too shabby. Probably the best conference we've ever done. How many how many years have you done that now? Uh, this will be Raleigh was the first, and Denver was the second, uh, at least in the American version, and then Dallas was the third. Okay, so cool. I mean, and then the, the I mean, we're, if we're talking about the FEIC conferences, they also did one in Edmonton. But those are the only ones the FEIC has done. All right. Yeah. Cool to hear. Um, so if you're ready to start, I've got, um, I don't know, roughly 10-ish questions just sure. to kind of get sure. for information. Sure. Let's do it. So to start, um, just kind of in general, what initially sparked your interest into just conspiracies in general? Uh, just, I mean, just general conspiracies and before Flat Earth? Yes. Oh, uh, it goes all the way back to before the, even the internet. Uh, the Oliver Stone movie, JFK, in 1991, I believe. Saw it in the theater with a packed house on opening weekend. Up until that point, I didn't even consider that people in power would lie for any reason, shape, or form. I, I grew up on a rural island up north of Seattle. So, grew up very sheltered, very naive. And then after JFK, it's like, oh, okay. So, it is possible. And then it just became a slippery slope from there. So after hearing that of like this possibility that people in power could kind of manipulate things that kind of sparked other things. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, it started a whole new chain of, of thought, which was that we all know there are conspiracies out there. It's just, there's ones we're willing to look at and ones that we're not willing to look at. Uh, the mainstream media will, will sanction conspiracies, but they won't generally use the word conspiracy. They'll use either the word scandal or the word tragedy. They will never use the word conspiracy. So like Enron some years ago, a giant, massive financial scandal. Uh, but it technically, legally, it was a massive conspiracy that brought down not only a massive um, oil and gas company, but one of the largest accounting companies in the world. Um, and then you have like 9-11, which because people died, it's called a tragedy. And that was supposedly tidied up really nicely. But then you have like, and, but okay, I'm sorry. There's there probably would be a third one. That would be like the JFK assassination, which is neither a scandal nor a um, tragedy. It's just considered an assassination, even though conspiracy wise, it's probably one of the weirdest because <clears throat> it was a lone gunman who then was in turn killed by a lone gunman which I don't even get into right now. So. so, I guess, going more general, what initially, um, what sparked your interest into Flat Earth? Like, what first kind of called you to be able to look at that? Boredom. Sheer conspiracy boredom. That was that was literally it. I had, I had seen it all. I had done it all. I, I would never, ever consider myself a tinfoil hat type of guy, but I had an opinion on just about every conspiracy you could think of. You could just rattle off anything. I'd be like, oh, yeah. You know, do some of my favorites, some some I don't like. You know, do I think that um, uh, Bigfoot had Elvis's baby? Probably not. Uh, but if you you know if we started digging into JFK or Pearl Harbor or nine eleven or something, I, I'd give you my opinion on it. Uh, then it just I, seriously, it was literally if you saw the documentary at all, it was the last book on the shelf. It's like, all right, well, I haven't looked at it, not getting any younger, so why why don't we just knock this thing out? and thought I could take down Flat Earth in three days. Honestly, I thought I could do that. In fact, most people in the Flat Earth community think they can just crush it. That's what the t-shirt literally reads. It says, I became a Flat Earther because I tried to shut down Flat Earth or debunk it or disprove it or whatever. And that was the beginning of a horrible rabbit hole, which nine months later, the beginning of 2015, I just gave up. And I said, okay, I'm going the other way. I'm going to make a series of videos. I'm going to say, I can't prove the globe in a court of law anymore can't prove it can't do it show me where i'm wrong and i made a series of videos i did uh, the first seven and eight days just cranked them out and knew nothing about video editing nothing about narration nothing about anything just made a series of videos put them out to the internet hive mind and said all right what do you got and then people just started calling me 
uh, you know, not just g the general public, but media and then uh, subject matter experts to where here we are four years and change later. And I've done more traveling because of Flat Earth in the last year than I've done in probably my previous 15. So when when you started looking at Flat Earth, um, yeah. When did you start noticing that it might have had some credibility? Like what kind of started to turn you into like, oh, this might actually be something that's true? Uh, because I was looking for, I'm a big believer in script writing. I'm a big believer in writing when it comes to, especially when it comes to fiction and movies. Uh, writing is everything. And if there's too many, I kind of call it, I, I call it the story boat. Story boat goes from point A to point B. If there's too many plot holes, the story boat sinks, the suspension of disbelief is broken, and people, you know, you, you've talked to many people, it's like, oh yeah, I just wasn't buying it, or I just wasn't into it, or I wasn't invested in the movie. That was, that's kind of like, when I give any sort of conspiracy credibility, that's what I look at. I look at the, I look at the plot holes, and I say, okay, do the ends justify the means, and could I have done it better than whatever? You put yourself on the other side of the fence and say, Okay, is because in conspiracy, you have your good guys and your bad guys. And, mm -hmm. and everyone says, oh, it's the government, it's the Illuminati, it's all these other sinister groups. And it's like, okay, it's fine, but what are they trying to do? And when I looked at this, as I dug into it, I realized that the moves they were making are exactly the moves they should have made. And the short version of it is this. If the world, because we're not talking about even a very old conspiracy. We're talking, this is actually very new, even though the concept is very old. We're saying that even our best and brightest didn't know for sure until about 1960 because we just didn't have the tech to, to figure it out. And then when they figured it out, it's like, okay, what do you what moves do you make at that point? Um, you seal off Antarctica with the Antarctic Treaty. You create NASA and then announce the Van Allen radiation belts and militarize space and spend a whole bunch of money and do a lot of things that didn't make sense the, the the kicking point for me though was probably antarctica because it went against the narrative meaning money and greed and power rule the world we all know this money corrupts power corrupts and this particular i have never seen a conspiracy up until now that was bigger than money you know money's always a factor and in this sure. case, it was like Antarctica, Admiral Byrd goes, you know, does a, does a mission down there in the early 50s, comes back and says, oh, the place is made out of money. There's nobody there. There's nothing to step on. It's absolutely a gold mine, you know, coal and uranium and minerals and, and oil. And yet, almost immediately, every country that needed these resources signed a unilateral agreement that says, oh, yeah, nobody's going down there for any reason. And then they locked it down till the end of time. And you say, well, no, no, I, 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 you could, you could spend fifteen thousand dollars and go to Antarctica right now. Yes, you could. And you put on your orange vest and you get on a raft and they take some pictures with penguins. But running in the interior, not a chance. Not without a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of approval. So that just again, it went against everything that I've ever seen. Where the the countries, massive countries. And here's here's the, the the one more thing, which is. Not only are, let's say you start your own country tomorrow. Let's say you, you discover this weird ore on your land and become an economically viable power. Almost immediately, a piece of paper would be put in front of you and says, oh yeah, by the way, you can't, can't go down to, down to Antarctica ever. None of your corporations can go down there. And then you say, how long? You said, well, forever, basically. Not only are you not allowed to do that, you're not even allowed to talk about it. That's the part that just threw me. Because look, we all know... Uh, if, I mean, where you are, I, I don't know what the, the layout is of, of oil and gas, but if you want to start fracking in somebody's backyard tomorrow, you could do it. And we have, we have done so much fracking in the United States. We just give out briefcases of money and do that. Uh, and yet these same companies aren't even allowed to, to talk about it. If, if, sorry, I know I'm going off in the weeds here for a little bit. No, you're if, fine. I, if I was the head of British Petroleum, I would run a full page ad in the London Times forever every every week saying how great it would be for my company to go down to antarctica at somewhere at the highest levels of powers somebody went to these execs whoever the highest guy is because always comes down to one guy and said oh yeah by the way this is a national security issue down there and don't even think about it and pass that on to your underlings and so that that was my my big thing for for me and then it just kind of spider webbed after that it gave people ideas all I had to do is really, sorry, I got I to gotta get this out, which is, can I prove to you right now, whether I had 20 minutes or an hour or two hours, can I prove to you the, the flat earth exists? No. 
No, I can't. But I can create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to turn is some sort of flat earth model. And if you're saying, you know, because some scientists have come back to me and said, well, you know, reasonable doubt isn't enough. I go, oh, yeah, yeah, it is. In fact, reasonable doubt works in court every day of every year. So, and that's that's all it took for the general public. The general public latched onto it, and now it's resonating at levels that even I didn't predict. So, so you would say the Antarctica piece in general being bigger than money is... Was that the thing that like 100% sold you to say, yes, the earth is flat? 99% sold me. Uh, I, I don't think I can be 100% on anything. And here's why. In fact, I, I put that in my speech, which uh, I, I modified my speech the last part of the year, which is uh, I use the coelacanth. You ever heard of that stupid fish? Coelacanth fish? Yes, I have. Okay, perfect. So the coelacanth fish, dead, extinct, 70 million years. Fossil mm -hmm. records, everybody knows it's part of that era. Uh, dead, 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 super dead. For 70 million years and at one point every scientist in the world would have bet 100 percent and their careers and everything they owned you know they would have gone to vegas and they would have bet the farm that that was true and then they caught one off the coast of south africa in 1940 and then another one off of mozambique and then madagascar and now you know you can look up online and national geographic swimming with them the point is is that you can't, I'm, I'm open to at least one. I always leave at least 1% just because of that stupid fish now. Because every, I mean, seriously, every scientist would have said, oh yeah, 100% case closed, RIP, blah, blah, blah. And they were wrong. So, but the bigger question there is how did they screw that up so badly? They screwed it up because no one was willing to look at the, re revisit the foundation, which was they saw the fossil record. They said they carbon dated it and it matches that, that, that part. And so, I have fun with that. Like, for example, uh, if I say, if I asked you, hey, you know, you've heard of the Loch Ness Monster, you probably don't believe in it. And you're like, no, I don't believe in it. I go, really, why? Well, the Loch Ness Monster, we're talking about dinosaurs swimming in the lakes of England, or at least one lake in England, been dead for at least 100 million years. And then I show you that stupid fish. And then, and, and we'll take it one step further. Let's say, because remember, this, this thing wasn't caught off rod and reel. They just caught it in a net. <laughs> so let's say that thing was a little more elusive. Uh, then what, you know, we're still making jokes about it to this day. One of the parts that, you know, no offense to you, but the part that bugs me about science is, is that once it's proven, they just wrap it into, you know, it's like, oh, it's, it's ours now. It's like the giant panda was a myth until we got one, the giant anaconda, the giant squid, they were all myths. They were all, they might as well have been the Kraken for God's sakes. And as soon as we catch one, it's like, oh, well, <laughs> Here's the explanation for it. There's no apology. Just driving. Uh. So they get to make fun of everybody there. It's like, it's like, they're just talking about unicorns. And then all of a sudden a unicorn shows up. It's like, well, here's why there's unicorns. Uh, sorry. Anyway, I ramble. No, you're fine. So contending on with that, uh, getting a little more specific into the flat earth model. By, by the way, were you in a flag football game today? I was not. No. Why? No, your shirt. Oh no! This is just this is a shirt I got at some store at the mall. Oh okay. Is, it, I mean, is that is that is I is that a color thing or is that a smudgy thing on the side of it? Uh, no, right like there. Your, oh, I get it. It's the pattern. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, so, okay. <laughs> got it. Look like like you like you came out of a house fire or something. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> so why I know you went into this a little bit on some of your um, flat earth clues videos but yeah. why exactly was the dome and the flat earth created why do you think why was it created yes uh, because you can't have a pressurized system without it meaning uh, the the short version is is that if you have an atmosphere like what we're breathing right now uh, you have to have some sort of pressure. No, no different than water pressure. You have to have, if you're going to have atmospheric pressure, you've got to have a dome over it. Uh, meaning, and it's one of my, one of my favorite arguments, which is um, pressure. It's one of the law of thermodynamics, which is pressure can't exist without a barrier. Mm -hmm. Meaning if you have, is there a second floor above you right now? Uh, yes. There per is. Perfect. Let's say that second floor was turned into a vacuum. You put a cork in the ceiling, you popped it. What's going to happen? Instantly, violently, it is the pressure is going to equal between your room and the, all the air is going to rush up there and you might black out and might even die. I don't know. And the question is, why didn't gravity hold it in your room right now? And you say, well, because it's a vacuum chamber and pressure equalizes. I go, well, okay, that's my point. 
which is the vacuum of space supposedly is infinitely bigger and the atmosphere here is infinitely smaller. We're talking about the entire atmosphere. So why is our atmosphere still on here? And then you say gravity. And I go, oh, yeah, just remember the experiment I just had you do just now with the exact same gravity in the exact same room. Uh, unless you can come up with something else other than that. Uh, it, so anyway, sorry, There's that's the barrier for you. And by the way, it also helps with um, climate change, the climate change argument, which is people, I don't know if it's on your list. People, It's weird how many people have asked me in the last year, do I believe in climate change? And I say, well, don't greenhouse gases make a lot more sense if it's an actual greenhouse? Maybe? Same. Okay. I see what you're saying. And kind of more, I guess this would kind of be more your opinion. When do you think the dome was created? Like how, <laughs> how old is it? These are big <laughs> questions, by the way. <laughs> Tell me the meaning of existence in a paragraph. <laughs> uh when do I think it was created? Okay, I do not think it was created billions of years ago. How about that? Uh, do I think that this world is billions of years old? Nah, I don't think so. Uh, because I could think. I also think the carbon dating system is just a nightmare. If you have any doubt of that, look up um, the the new rock formations they've um, done on Mount St. Helens. They've they've carbon dated them. You know, brand new rock formations. They're dating them at one hundred fifty thousand years old. No, 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 these are brand new. So, and remember, I, I mean, I'm old enough to remember Mount St. Helens back in 1980. So, um, how old is this place? Do I, th okay, first off, do I, we're, we're talking about levels of civilizations. So, if our civilization's unbroken history only goes back 5,000 years, how many of those, how much gap is there between every civilization? Because I don't think we're the per first people to rent this apartment by a long shot. Uh, and then how much terraforming has to occur between those civilizations? I don't think it takes that much time at all. And we've learned this through recent volcanic volcanic activity, which is you can terraform very, very quickly if you wanted to. So do I think it's hundreds of thousands of years old? Yeah, sure. How about that? Uh, but that's about as far as I'm willing to go. Millions of years, I don't think is, ne is necessary. Okay. Just a stab, yeah. but I think it's pretty good one. On the subjects of big questions, because this might be another one, in your opinion, in your opinion, who do you think created? <laughs> <laughs> who is God, Mark? I know you mentioned God as kind of this vague-ish topic of like a creator. Oh no, no, no! <laughs> I mean, you can you can go one of two ways. I, I don't have to, you know. I, I I've had to play it because I'm kind of the recruiter. I'm not on the um the spiritual side as much. Because you know, my, my job is just get people into the freaking uh, doors. Um, mm -hmm. You can only go one of two ways, which is, okay, it's either an older and much more powerful civilization that's been around a lot longer than us, or the divine. And if it, for you, it's Santa Claus in a white bathrobe on Sunday, that's fine. Or if it's one of the other four major religious houses, also fine. Um, but it's But the default shape of it means that it was built meaning if it's not some if you want to call this organic that's fine but if it's not if it's not a globe or a ball or a sphere if it is some sort of snow globe terrarium planetarium pizza box whatever you want to call it then it was built and then again you're really kind of you're kind of like splitting hairs and i don't want to diminish the religious side because you know it's kind of like the, the, what we used to joke about uh, the difference between magic and science you know, I, I call science just magic without mystery. That's it. Even though we have some stuff out there in science, they still can't explain, but it's repeatable, kind of like the double slit experiment, which is kind of magic, but I don't want to get into that. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's what's one man's, let's say it's an older civilization, right? One man's older civilization is another man's deity. So if a giant golden sh spaceship landed somewhere, let's say in the middle of France, came out and said, we built the place or had a, a hand in it, uh, there would be a whole bunch of people. There two camps would f fall into it. Two people, one camp would say, oh, wow, they do look like the people from Avatar. And the other camp would, would just start a church, like immediately. And they would form this church. And it's like, we must pay homage to the blue people. So, Does, is that what the majority of flat earthers believe? Just like a higher civilization and or a divine being created it oh yeah yeah yeah. atheism is really tough to do in flat earth um i'm not going to say that flat earth is going to kill atheism entirely but we're not talking about agnostic we're talking full-blown atheism but it is crippling it right now 
uh, at least like in the community, I, I was asked demographics just recently and at least in the United States, I can't speak for a, a lot of the other English speaking countries, but in the United States, at least half of the Flat Earth members are hardcore Christians. And the okay. other 90 something percent believe in something. They're, they're more agnostic, but they believe in spirituality. I, I'm the prime example of that. I was raised born again Christian, and then I got into the tech field for 20 years. And when I got out, when I, when I got into this, this snapped me back. Now, I don't go to church every Sunday or memorize hymns or anything else, but. I understand my 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 relationship with the whole spiritual side of things has changed. Uh, you, maybe even just as basic as good and evil. If if you are in a place where there could be someone looking over your shoulder for real this time, you know it's kind of like the Santa naughty and nice list. Doesn't mean anything until you actually see Santa. And it's like oh crap, you can do anything naughty again? Probably not. I will I will never gun to my head. I will not do anything malicious to anyone ever again. Which is one of the reasons why I think Flat Earth has such a powerful message. It's not just that you're not alone, that you have now the potential to live up to everything that you were supposed to be. Okay, that's actually a really kind of deep overlying. Um, because I know you mentioned that in one of your videos about how we might be being watched and how. Oh yeah. And we're not, we're, not, we're not talking about maximum overlord, but it could be just as simple as you know, a parent looking over the top of their newspaper, make sure you're not burning anything. You know, I, I, you, I mean, if you watch the clues, you got the traffic light reference, which is, you know, why, why don't you blow through a stoplight if you know there's a camera there? Well, because there's a camera yeah. there. It's like, well, then why were you thinking about it? <laughs> we're, the, the old line from the Batman movie, I still think is great. And that is, we're only as good as the system allows us to be. We have a we have an innate we have a mischievous side, and I know you're not old enough to remember the old old science fiction movies, but the early ones, like the original, the day of the Earth stood still, it was a fascinating. This is back in the '50s, mind you, and which was, they basically put a barrier around the Earth, and said, "Oh yeah, but you're not going anywhere because the one of my lines is okay. Why would you why would you seal us in, or, or why have the dome at all, right? Why not just the air pressure? Why it's like okay." Are we a box of kittens that are being protected from something that's outside of this place? Or are we a box of scorpions that should never, ever be let out ever for any reason? Well, uh, every science fiction author I think I've ever run into over the years has addressed that and has said, yeah, we're, we're the scorpions. You don't want human <laughs> beings running amok out there. So um, moving on, on mm -hmm. I know one thing I don't, really recall you mentioning in the flat earth clues was something about like national disasters and phenomenons like i know you mentioned volcanoes but sure. what was your take on let's say earthquakes and the argument of tectonic plates oh i got no problem with tectonic plates and and how they work in a flat earth i mean if you squish everything down just about just about every system works better works more efficiently on a uh, on a flat model than it does a globe and that's everything from the jet stream to the underwater conveyor system to tectonics to whatever magma systems underneath and i know i caught a lot of hell for 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 mentioning it's like well the magma system would have to be artificial too because pe but people couldn't fathom it they couldn't they there that was an engineering feat that was so beyond us but supposedly it's like no we can melt things like that we just do it on a much much smaller scale um but if you ever get a chance, look at the jet streams on an AE map. Look at the underwater conveyor system on an AE map. It's beautiful. It's it's circular. Uh, it's it's efficient. It runs just perfectly. Uh, I I and so sorry to your point. Tectonics, not not a problem. Um, now, as far as natural disasters goes, I think that human beings have been changing things, not just with the weather. Uh, through internal combustion engines. And, and, and so, yes, I do believe in com climate change only for the fact that, look, every automobile that's out there is just a little furnace. We have, what, several, let's say, let's just round down, 2 billion furnaces running at any given point nonstop throughout the day, right? Mm -hmm. That's a lot. And over, you do that over, I don't know, a year, 10 years, 20 years, it's going to, it's going to cause an effect. No different than bringing a propane lantern into your car. And you're saying, well, okay, what's the point? I go, well, turn on the air conditioning in your car and then turn on that propane lantern in the back and see where the hot and cold spots change. Because they will. And if you put another propane lantern, another one, you, eventually you're going to have the real problem on your hands. 
then you throw in other weather modification stuff, potentially like harp. And why wouldn't you have harp? I know, I know it's a conspiracy and people, it's like, oh no, that sounds like a government kooky thing. It's like, well, the government, the military wants to, wants to weaponize everything if they can. And using weather as a weapon is just genius because there's no fingerprint. You know, if you can send something off to another country, it's like, we didn't do it. <laughs> I have no idea why you had three cyclones in a row hit your islands. <laughs> it's funny. Uh, just a little specifically on tectonic plates real fast. Yeah. What is your opinion on the theory of Pangea? Pangea, I think, was one of the early versions of this world. As a matter of fact, I love, sorry, every time I think of Pangea, I think of the 1980s, late 1980s um, television show Pangea of the same name, um, which is which is a weird little show. Uh, the Pangea, otherwise known, if, if, if you're going to publish this anywhere, uh, you know, uh, known as the supercontinent. Is, well, absolutely. Of course, you know, every kid looks at the, at the Mercator map, even though the Mercator map is screwed up and they start fitting things in their head. And if you have a three dimensional thinking, you can really start fitting stuff together. So did Pangea exist? Sure. You bet. But Pangea on a, on a globe doesn't work nearly as well compared to Pangea on a, um, uh, on a, on a flat model because Pangea on a flat model is just a big mass in the center, which I think was part of the early terraforming. I think that this place has been built and modified over the civilizations uh, kind of you know kind of like not not to say that um god has been it's kind of like a sandbox but it feels that way you know that it's like okay you start out with something simple and then you make you know you spread things out change weather patterns add more complexity to it uh make the people smaller make the things smaller uh, change the climate and you know here we are uh, we're, which I still think we're kind of like the end of our civilization, kind of not a doom and gloom, but it's like, I think we pretty much tapped out in what we can do. So Pangea could kind of be like, I don't know, quote unquote, a beta testing of <laughs> yeah. what later years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not? I mean, every, every terraforming, uh, not to go into the software simulations, but every map editor we've ever done, I was in software for years. You know, you start out with simple, simple stuff and the tools just get more and more complex. Uh, look into the old, old, old game back to 2000. <laughs> Go back to the 2000 game, uh, SimCity, the original one. SimCity, the, the original game didn't start out as a disaster relief thing. It started out, I mean, that's, oh, I'm sorry, that's what it was supposed to be. It was just supposed to be repair your city from tornadoes, repair it from, you know, hurricanes and all this stuff. But what they didn't rather was they kept adding more things to the editor to where they realized it was actually more fun to build out the city than it was to destroy it. Way, you know, the, so the game ended up changing. So I think in this case, Pangea, you start out with a basic, here's the thing. With, with Pangea, your problem is, is everything's tied together. There's no water barriers. Think mm -hmm. of, uh, and I always get a kick out of this because when I, when I travel, people still over in the Middle East call this the new world. Still to this really? day. And that's because for a long time, it didn't exist. It wasn't on the maps because you couldn't get there because there was a water barrier. So Pangea, yeah, was the, 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 the basic. Pangea might as well just have been Asia. <laughs> That's all it really was. It was just a giant squashed up Asia. Then you spread things out and you create some water barriers. That changes everything. Changes exploration, changes how populations migrate, changes war. Uh, wonderful, wonderful complexities come out of creating water barriers. Okay. And I guess speaking of water, mm -hmm. how about the um, tides and how they relate to the moon? Oh, yeah, yeah. They don't. <laughs> only, only that in that the moon and the sun and the stars are a clock system. It's just a coincidence. Meaning if the sun and the moon are these tiny, tiny little things, the last thing, it, w w let's treat it mechanically, right? Let's say the sun and the moon are less than 50 miles wide, which is what we say. Uh, okay. They're just you know tiny, tiny objects in the scar sky. The last thing you would ever do is try to hook up some molecular magnet to the moon and try to deal with the tides that way. It'd be really, really inefficient and ugh, it'd be awful. It'd be, it'd be a technical nightmare. So you treat it no differently than gravity, which is you do it from down below. I mean, gravity, you can remember that science, and I love this line, is because Tyson was the first one to, to really, we latched onto him, which was, we can't tell you what gravity is. We can only tell you what it does. We can tell you its symptoms. We can't replicate it. Well, at least the military might be able to, but we can't. Uh, we can only tell you what it does. So... What is gravity? Well, science is gravity is this magical molecular force that pulls things down to the center of a ball. 
and we say that gravity is a magical molecular force that just pulls things straight down. So all you have to do is alter that force even slightly and the tides are a piece of cake. Tides are easy, easy to do. But no, you would never do them by the moon. Never, ever do. Now, again, because the, the, remember that what I love about the sky is the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets, they're all just a fantastically elaborate clock system. Very, very precise. And, the, you know, for signs and wonders. And it's universal, which is which is, I love, love even more. Meaning you don't have to even know a language to figure out the clock. Eventually, you're going to solve it. If, you know, you're bored back in however, you're staring at the sky going, huh, huh, hey, I get this now. You know, it's it's the it's the oldest clock system ever built. So how specifically, I guess, how is gravity created exactly? Or do do we not know the answer to that? Um, I'll, I'll take the cop out answer on this and I'll call it gravity for us because we didn't even know how to do it until about 20 years ago, which was it's just a physics engine. That's all. I mean, you're young enough to know what you've heard of that term, which is yeah. how do you. How do objects fall in a simulation? Well, we just design a physics engine and we create the rules and that's all it is. They just fall. Uh, so gravity here, again, it's just this magical invisible force that pulls. It's a molecular magnet. That's all it is. And it's controlled artificially by something, whoever built the place. And there's not much more to it. It has nothing to do with mass. Uh, has not, now, now, that being said, though, because you probably have heard this at least more than once, some people are saying that density is involved. So, yes, it is also a, com there's also a combination of density there, meaning lighter objects float up and heavier objects go down. Uh, no different than taking like a volleyball under, underwater. It's going to pop back up. Why? Because it's, it's less dense. Um, density can do a lot, but you can't do, you can't account for all of it. There's some flat earthers out there that just absolutely subscribe to density only. Like, oh, it's, it's all density. There is no gravity. And so then the myth, it's like, oh, gravity doesn't exist. It's like, nah, it probably exists. Uh, but it does, I don't think it does it alone. It doesn't, it has help from density because remember what we're breathing in now is just a thin, okay. thin version of water. Okay. So moving on a little to talk about the Behind the Curve documentary. Yeah. One of the big criticisms it kind of got was the i'm sure you've heard of the gyroscope test yes how flat earthers spent the money on the gyroscope right said if they got this value the earth is round and they consistently got that right what first, do you what do you have to say for that first off uh the power of editing <laughs> because by the time we got to the end of that movie the director god bless him i spent seven months with that team they hated us <laughs> They hated the concept. They, well, you know what? Let me let me take that back. They didn't hate the players. They hated the game, which okay. was they didn't hate Bob or Jaron or I or Chris or any of those guys. They just hated the entire concept. Uh, that being said, and I don't want to dodge the gyroscope thing too much. Does the gyroscope show that the sky is moving or does it show that the earth is moving? We say that uh, the sky is moving and mainstream science will say that the earth is moving and neither two can can get to any sort of consensus on that, which is unfortunate. Um, the gyroscope, I knew the gyroscope, I, you want to spend $20,000 on something, something that's fine. Uh, I knew it was going to be the, I knew it was going to be the end all be all because outside of you and I, again, what's your major? Uh, communication. Oh, okay. Other than you and other you know people that are in academics, the average person on the street knows almost nothing about math or physics or engineering, and so the gyroscope, they were lost. I mean, hell, they were lost by the the laser test at the end. I knew this because I sat with in the film festivals with some of these audiences, and I talked to them afterwards. Like the the Jaron laser experiment, which I thought you were going to bring up that rather than the gyroscope thing, um, where where I would ask people, I go I go, do you know what happened? And they go, no. But it was bad, right? And I go, well, kind of. Do you know? Do you know what the experiment was? No, I have no idea. But it was really fascinating, you know, because by the time you got a hundred minutes in, that was that was the literally the last shot of the movie. People were just so, you know, their pupils were dilated. They had no idea what the hell was going on. Um, but also, again, power of editing. But also Jaron's fault, which was he never even went out to the site to check to see to the to the to the area to see if he had line of sight. He just went based on Google Earth. And just went out to this ravine, you know, this this reservoir. Didn't even go out during the daylight. 
until way later. And it's like, oh, hey, I didn't have line of sight anyway. It's like, oh, dude. It's like, what were you doing? The director was just, and, and he called the director up a second time. So the first time he melted the condenser on his laser. And this was not a big budget film. You know, they were on shoestrings. And so then Jaron called him up later after the conference. He says, oh, no, I got it this time. I totally got it this time. And he didn't have it. And so the director, but the director took shots at us. Sorry about that. Let me, let me go back real quick. The, the director took shots at us because if you remember in the movie, if you only saw it once, you may not have caught it. When that 12 year old kid walked up to the microphone and was asking me questions. Yeah. Yeah. That's when the whole thing changed. That's when, and you could, you could listen to it on the, um, the director's commentary on iTunes where he said, yeah. And everyone in the room in the director's comments, said, oh yeah, this is where we had to take a stand. Right, right then and there. It's like, what? It's like, when were you going to tell us this? Uh, the, apparently, it's the old saying, and that is, it's all fun and games until the kids, kids are involved. You know, they didn't want us to influence the future. And so that's when they had to take their shots. So, no, they were not going to paint Bob in a good light or Jaron in a good light. And they, there's only so much they could do with me. So, so the gyroscope test and the, uh, the laser test, those were just kind of errors in people not understanding what they well the results mean yeah it, i mean the laser test honest to god there was there was nothing we could do because he, the laser was never going to get there he wasn't on level ground and jaron should have known better and the way that daniel shot it he was going to kind of like the green button do you remember the green button scene with me it was subliminal you probably wouldn't have caught it okay so i'm at the kennedy space center and i'm sitting down and there's this display above my head. It's like one of those things where I'm back in a chair and there's a display above my head. And I'm hitting the screen up there. I think it's a touch screen. Of course, I should have known better because NASA has no tech at this place. And uh, there was this giant green button. And of course, I mean, there was only one button. I mean, the whole thing. Of course, I hit it a few times. But just before or after I left frame, the director zoomed in on this green button. And then the editor, editor came up with a great idea. It was like, hey, what if we just edit it so that Mark never hits the button. And that's what they did. And they apologized for me during, you know, during the premiere. It's like, hey, you know, do you mind we took this shot at you? And I go, well, that was pretty funny, I guess. But yeah, what am I going to do? It's your movie. I go, you, you can take that shot. But the, the point was, is the, 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 the creators of this film had nothing to do with us whatsoever. They were going to paint us in a bad light. With the, with the gyroscope, look... We're going to tell you again, it comes down to, okay, the, the gyroscope registered a 15 degree movement. We all know exists. The question is, is it the sky or is it the ground? Tell me how the gyroscope is going to prove one way or the other, that outcome. I don't know. Okay. So your, in your Flat Earth Clues videos, you say that the two videos, Long Haul and Magic Show are kind of the most, the easiest to grasp and kind of the first place to look, right? Yes, I'll say that. Sure. So, that. what have you heard the argument that the reason why those flights are so long with so many multiple connections is because it could be a business model that to gain more revenue? Oh, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. But I've talked to all the pilots that I could, and they all said the same thing. It's like it, when it comes to the airlines, and I can't stress this enough, it is all about fuel, period. And that we're not talking about international flights. We're talking to me, domestic flights. If they can gain even a couple degree swing during uh, even a, a, a local flight across the United States, they'll do it because all they care about. Because remember, it's it's that's just cash that's sitting in those wings. That's mm -hmm. all they all they care about. They go picking going up that far north to go down. They said would absolutely make no sense at all. The bigger question, and I was really surprised more people didn't latch on to this, was that. 95% of the flights in the Southern Hemisphere are connections, multiple connections, big ones. And we're talking, the, I, I, there was a travel agent, one of my subject matter experts, I, one of my shows that I did, where she said, she goes, you don't know how lucky you have it up in the north. You know, the northern, you know, up in the United States. She goes, you can get nonstops to just about anywhere. In the south, there are capital cities that you cannot get nonstops between. Capital cities. And it doesn't matter how much money you have, you can't get them. So, and, and people just glossed right over that. It's like, well, I found five, you know, which is why I did the magic show. You know, you, you watched it. It's like, well, I found like five nonstop nonstops. It's like only five in the entire Southern hemisphere. You don't think that's strange. Oh, no, I found five. It's like, oh my God. Um, 
The other thing, though, you know, because, no, you could go down this road a little further if you wanted to, because I have other people mentioned that the flight times during these nonstops do make some sense if it's a globe. And then I have to go into, okay, you know, is, is it a jet stream thing that they're latching onto? Is there, is there something in the flight patterns on an AE map that they can take advantage of? You know, because the jet stream's pretty pretty quick. And the planes can go, they don't have to go supersonic if they're going with the jet stream. You know, if you're going on a really, really fast river, you know, in a boat, you don't have to floor it to, to get up really, really big speed. So, I don't know, maybe. We, we haven't figured out everything yet. We've only been doing this for four years. And could you speak a little more on, because you said if there's only five flights that do exist, right. can you speak more on those flights? Because if they do exist, wouldn't they go against the flat earth model and go more with the globe model? Again, potentially, sure. I That was one of the first things, that, that's why I made the magic show, because people called me up and said, oh yeah, I found I found A or, the, oh my God, if I had to hear that Qantas flight as many times as I did. Um, the question is when they're going, and, and some, I know there's flat earthers say, oh no, they're fake, they're not real. There's a couple things though I think are interesting. One is, for, first thing is that, and I didn't realize this, I've had to learn as I go along, is that if you're flying a nonstop, and you land somewhere and nobody gets on or off, technically it's still a nonstop. And there are fuel islands that are around, you know, the Southern hemisphere that, and we've, I've, we've seen this only through social media where people stop. So, oh yeah, we stopped at such and such. And you know, people are looking at their tickets, of course, you know, on those longer flights, they're usually alcohol fueled anyway. So it's like, why are we landed? Oh, who cares? Another round, you know, that whole thing. But the other thing, the bigger thing was in the magic show was I didn't care because the route couldn't be proven. Meaning the latitude and longitude, this is when I got into the whole GPS system, the latitude and longitude system. Remember, this is a United States military blanket coverage system, supposedly 32 satellites done in the mid nineties. And yet there are these huge swaths of areas especially down in the, the, the Indian Ocean, the South Atlantic and South Pacific, where there's just no coverage at all. And so that's why, why I said, you know, the planes just blink out. You can, yeah, I mean, in some cases you'll see the graphic, but the latitude and longitude changes from whatever number it is to uh, approximated or estimated mode. And it stays there, literally will not change until they're, they're within 150, 175 miles of wherever they're going to land you know, the coastline. And then once they get within land radar range, oh, wow, look at that, latitude and longitude pop in, which goes into the whole, and again, I don't, you're probably not old enough to remember the whole Malaysian disaster some years ago where we lost cap, you know, uh, flagships, like triple sevens. We lost them in the Indian Ocean for no apparent reason. Never have found the wreckage, even now. It's like, what? We're talking state-of-the-art black boxes, the whole nine yards, because they didn't know where the planes were. It's, it's so weird to, to watch. And so what I, what I was basically saying in the clues was that it appears that the old Loran system, which is land radar, they just slapped another sticker on it and says, oh yeah, we, we've got, no, and by the way, I'm not saying there aren't satellites. I'm just saying they aren't those kind of satellites. Most of them are part of the, and hopefully I'm not going off too far off topic, uh, the high altitude balloon program satellites from the from nasa not a big secret the, the nasa is the biggest world's consumer of helium in the, they they launch they've been launching and they can launch massive massive payloads upwards of four tons so if you can launch a four ton satellite on a balloon what the hell are you using rockets for exactly i mean unless you're saying well they're going out much much further you know like geosynchronous orbit and stuff like that it's like really Really? Because, um, I mean, 95% of our data, our bandwidth is going through fiber optics under the ocean. You know, we've been laying cables since, oh, I don't know, about 1910. And we've just gotten better and better to where that's... And what are we talking about now? It's not satellites. It is fiber optics. <laughs> okay. So those flights that are, let's say, the, the Qantas one you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Since GPS is not tracking it as it goes through the ocean, is that flight following the flat Earth path, but people are just trying to throw it off and say, oh, it's going the globe model? Is that the argument you're trying to make? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what, that's just it. I don't know what route they're taking. That's the, okay. that's the weird part. And plus, if you look at the flat map, there are certain routes they can't take because it would be so if you look at the the flat map if you really want to take them you know the 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 globe version of it and take that wide arcing left hand or right hand turn 
uh, it would not be good as far as fuel goes. So what route they're taking? Again, I don't know. The route cannot be proven. And okay. why can't it? That's that's the bigger question. It's like, look, this is this is a blanket coverage military system. We're, we're not talking about, you know, Cracker Jack box stuff here. We're talking, you know, state of the art, the best of the best. So why does it why does it blink off? And I just found it literally on by accident where and you could you could do it yourself if you want. It's fun. OK, well, at least so, until the plane goes down, then it's not fun. <laughs> so let's say this theoretical situation I get in. I'm a multi-billionaire. I get in my super supersonic jet yep. and I fly to the edge. What would happen? Ah, <laughs> OK. Well, it's not, it's not as simple as that because, okay, one, you'd have to have a long haul. You'd have to have a state. Okay, let's say you're a, like a Saudi prince because they buy like 747s, 777s nowadays. So let's say you're a Saudi prince with a 777. Fully loaded. You crank this thing out and you start heading towards, well, what you think is the edge. A couple things you're going to run into first. Uh, one, you would have to have your pilot ignore the GPS system. That's a tall order on its own. Because eventually, once you got out to a certain area, once you got out onto the within, oh wow, even 500 miles of the Antarctic coastline, you're going to run into a problem because you're immediately going to be tracked because the treaty extends all the way up to the 60th parallel. But you're also going to have to bypass the compass because the compass doesn't work down at the at the South Pole, which is a whole nother thing. It's like ask anybody. It's not that's not us, by the way. We, there's wonderful. In fact, I watched a video just the other day where kid kids ask someone in Antarctica, what happens to the compass down at the South South Pole? Don't know. It doesn't really do anything. So you have to bypass the GPS system and the compass. And then what? Then what landmarkers are you going to use? You're just going to haul ass over the ice and and OK, sorry, one more. Which is, we're not saying that the Antarctic coastline is the edge of the world, which lots of people, I, the space asteroid thing has got to go. In fact, we did a press release during the conference. It's like, look, media, don't say that it's a space asteroid. It's not freaking Asgard. We have cosmic waterfalls. It's not Asgard. Thor did us no favors at all. <laughs> Um, but once you got to the Antarctic coastline, what I'm saying is the outer marker between the Antarctic coastline and the outer marker, we'll say the barrier, is thousands of miles. How many? I don't know because the military was flying basically blind around there in big arcing circles for the better part of 30 years from 1928 all the way up until about 1956. And only then is when they figured it out. So inland, it's got to be way in there. So, but to answer your question, because I'm sure you're dying to find out what happens if you get out there, what do you run into? What stops you? Do you run into, uh, you know, is, is it, is it a wall? Is it ice? Is it glass? Is it unified field? Is it a high frequency force field? Uh, heavy element, heavy water? I mean, I don't know. I mean, it could be, I know what we do in simulations when somebody gets out that far. Um, you throw in negative physics, which is fun, fun, fun. Uh, if you've ever played any games, uh, which is you get out to a barrier in the game and basically it slows you down to the point where you're moving, but you're not moving. Your legs are moving, but you can't go, you can't go forward. So that way you don't get hurt. I mean, you're not going to run into a wall or anything like that. So I think you could veer off planes that way. Uh, but you're not, even if you got there, kind of like, let's say Admiral Byrd in the United States Navy, that they figured it out back in um, uh, 1955, 1956. Um, if you found it, it, I don't know what, what you would do with it at that point. It's massive. And th again, the, the what if you follow the clues, um, we do, we do what any men would do. It's like, get the cannon, bring up the cannons. Let's see if we could bust through this thing. And then they just kept using bigger and bigger guns. And then finally for four years, they worked on this until finally they gave up in 1962. And now they're just kind of dealing with it, which is, I don't know if it's one of your questions. It's like, because if you, if the best, if you, if you found out 1960, would you tell the general public? And I know it's a big question because you're young, but would you tell the general public? Arguably, I would think yes. If I figured out some major fact about my or about my world that went against what the majority of people think, I would do my best to try and per get that out. Perfect. Help people. And that's and that's a wonderful, sincere answer, and I love it. Um, however, let's say you're a politician. Let's say you're the president of the United States, and then you go to your advisors and you say, "Well, what well, what do you guys think?" And then one of your advisors says, "Well." Uh, a couple things might happen. Uh, first off, 
academically, all your all, every university in the world, um, astrophysics and astronomy would be destroyed instantly. All your remaining physical sciences, geology, hydrology, biology, archaeology, goes on and on and on, would have to be retooled from the ground up. That's academic chaos immediately. Um, world markets would have to be suspended for several months because you have no idea what the ramifications are to the world economy. And then, of course, spiritually, you're you're basically giving the five major religious houses of the world, Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, you're all giving them simultaneous leverage against science. And com combine those three aspects, that's one of the shortest meetings ever. It's like, so we should probably hold on to this for a while. Just kind of keep it, keep it quiet. Yeah, that's exactly what they did. I would, and I absolutely agreed. It's like the, the public is not, was not ready was not ready in 1960 no way you could never control the spin of the information now you can now you can we've got high speed internet social media six billion smartphones now you could you could push any narrative you wanted and probably get away with it so could you so it kind of sounds like you're arguing that in the 1960s they were almost just delaying the inevitable this information would get out someday oh yeah 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 it's it's like hiding um a pack of cigarettes from your roommate you can move it around here and there, but eventually they're going to bump into it sooner or later, right? It's, it's, it, you can't hide something like this forever. It's too big. It's too, too big. Now, at the same time, it, it was it need to know is, is the rule here. Meaning you don't have to, pilots don't have to know, astronauts don't have to know, scientists don't have to know. Almost no one has to know except for the telemetry guys at NASA, see Capricorn one. Um, it's the ruling powers, you know, again, pick your, pick your group with people that have more money that, that so much money, they, they don't even think about money. Um, like, would the president of the United States have to know? Why? Neil Tyson? Why? Brian Cox? You wouldn't have to tell any of these guys. In fact, they're better off acting naturally because this is one of those things that's so big, you don't want them slipping up. Which is also why I think that Admiral Byrd, who died of a heart attack... Uh, one year later, after Operation Deep Freeze, he was too too comfortable on the press when, when it came to talking on camera. You, his last interview on the Long Jeans Chronoscope should prove that. I mean, the fact when he was talking, he, there was this line where he goes, he goes, oh yeah, and there's uranium down there, and yeah, I probably shouldn't have said that because we don't want to fight. It's like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm sure there was somebody watching that going, oh, yeah, we can't have him keep keep talking about this stuff. But he hadn't even found it yet. Anyway, sorry. Go ahead. So on, um, in general, the flat Earth model being exposed, yeah. in um, episode five, status quo, you talk about how the authority would be afraid of the unknown panic that would ensue yeah. if they released the information. Right. In Creative Force, episode eight, you talk about how the dome was being hidden because it allowed art and science and like beauty to flourish among humanity, correct? Right. right. So based on those two points, why exactly should the dome be exposed? now i mean why should we yeah. why should we let this thing out now because i think create creatively <coughs> excuse me i think creatively human our civilization has tapped out we have there, there's an old saying there's nothing new under the sun and i think we've run out of ideas if you have any doubt about that look at the progress of the main five major points of art um pictures sculptures music dance and literature When's the last time a great symphony has been written? When's the when's the last book that's been written that is just mind-blowingly big that isn't already 40, 50 years old or 100 years old? Um, goes on and on to where I even said, like, it will take modern media. Uh, and I challenge anyone, and no one's beaten me yet on this. And I say the greatest year in movies, in cinema, was 1999. That's 20 years old now. We have been rehashing and rebooting and retooling everything to where and i think that's i think that's part of not to get into a deeper subject i talk about it in the book which is um i think the universe runs off novelty which is you the imagination is what fuels this world and once you once you're tapped out you're tapped out that's it you know like anything i mean every television series eventually ends you know everything that has a beginning has an end and not to say there should be a sad ending it, but you know we we've run out of we've run out of things We've run out of novelty. We've run out of... Our civilization has gone as far as it's going to go without some sort of radical upheaval, uh, which would, of course, turn it into another civilization. So 
Where and honestly, uh, when I've been looking at what's been happening in the flat Earth over the last four years, it's not that we've been doing this against st steep, you know, stiff resistance. We've been assisted. You know, if Google wanted to shut us down, if YouTube wanted to shut us down, then we're talking about simple algorithms. You never recommend us to anybody on the side. You never fill in the blank up at the top. You you stunt our search engines, and they have slowed us down to an extent, but they have, but it's been token at best. Even Neil deGrasse Tyson, when he went on Comedy Central, he didn't use his A-game, not even close. You know, he didn't use any graphics or any movies. I mean, I would have done, if I was in shoes, I would have done all sorts of different stuff. Um, so short answer, why now? Why not? We, we've, we've taken as far as we can go. And I know that some science, inclu people including National Geographic says, isn't it possible that, you know, you could we could be taking a, a step backward in our civilization? It's like, can it be any worse than what we've done now? Meaning we've we've stagnated. We've run into look. The global warming thing isn't going to change anytime soon. We're still recycling programs and all the 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 awful things that we've done. We've done a lot of terrible things, and it's not going to. Politicians are not going to change it. The, there's a great line from a movie, and that is the the greatest power of money is that it allows bad men to continue doing bad things. And that's where we are. So I, I think it potentially flat earth could change everything. If you reveal this to the world, I think it could be potentially used to form a new golden age. I firmly believe that. It might be a bit optimistic, but what do I got to lose? Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, let's see. I guess. Okay. A little more specific talking about back to Antarctica. Sure. The Antarctic Treaty is set to run out in 2048. Oh, is, what, it is it eight now? I thought it was one, but that's fine. Either way, it's it's still 20, I, it's still 20 years off. Yeah. What do you think will happen when that runs? Nothing. Out? Like just, they're just going to kick it down the the road. Nothing. Nothing's going to happen in, in 2040. Uh, no different than every time I hear a story about how we're going to go to Mars five years from now. I've been hearing this story, by the way, since the early 90s. And nobody's, they just keep kicking that can down the road because, <coughs> excuse me, um, because the general public's attention span has dropped from, since social media was created, has dropped from 30 minutes down to seconds. And so you bring up a story, it's like, oh, we're going to go to Mars. And then five months from now, no one's even going to remember that story even existed. And we've I, we've seen it. We've been tracking it. And so when it comes to Antarctica, it's like, please, that that's no different than um, the Kennedy files because they were secret Kennedy files. We're going to be revealed like a f some years after Jackie's death, and that came, and they just re repurposed it and said, oh yeah, we're no 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 no. It's now they they just they just changed the date. That's all it is. Okay. So no, nothing nothing is happening in twenty forty. Uh, let's see. And just a few kind of general questions I have. Mm -hmm. um, personally, I think you did touch on this a little bit, a little bit, but what would you specify as your religious beliefs? I used to be, cause it's kind of a two stage thing. So I was raised a born again Christian, okay. went to youth group and camp Malibu church was not just a Sunday thing. It was very, very active, especially back in the eighties, especially on this Island. But when I went to university and found out there was actually other religions and that's how sheltered I was. And then it's like, what are Jewish people? And then I went to, um, it got into tech, you know, when you're into tech and Star Wars and Star Trek and Stargate, it just opens up a whole new thing. Um, <clears throat> but now, but once I got into flat earth, it became sort of a, a creator sort of thing. So now I am, I'm way more spiritually in touch with everything, but it's not specific. Okay. So I'm not going to be quoting, of course, it's part of my job. You know, it's like, I don't, I'm not going to be quoting a lot of chapter and verse from the King James Bible because I don't think it's fair to the other people. Now I, I let them sort it out. It's like, okay, I get them into flat earth. And if you guys want to decide, you know, why, you know, any of <laughs> The old Simpsons line is like, which is the one true religion? It's like, you know, you guys fight that out. I'm not going to get part of that. Uh, but all I can tell you is all those five religions are under the same flat earth banner. So I think I'm covered either way. Okay. How about, what would you say your political standing is? 
I've officially I've never voted in my life. Um, really? Yeah, yeah, no, never voted for anything in my life. I think at the federal level, your your vote is just wasted, uh, and here's why. And, and, and I'm not trying to be a downer or anything. It's like, man, you're, you know, Captain Bring Down. No, no, no. Here's here's the deal. So let's say I'm a billionaire, right? And I'm in the United States. Who and an elections coming up? Who do I give my money to? Well, we get in this discussion about the environment or big business or, you know, different demographic rights. We just go back and forth, back and forth. It's like, no, 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 you're missing the point. I'm going to give $2 million to this candidate and I'm going to give $2 million to the other side. Why? Because neither of them care about loyalty. All they care about is the money. They just care about the check. They don't, they don't care if you vote, you know, you gave $2 millions to here. They know you're, you're covering your bets because either way, $2 million doesn't just get me dinner and a selfie with whoever wins. It always goes, gives me a chance to manipulate policy. And if I donate enough money and if I have enough friends there together, we can absolutely manipulate policy. What's my point? The point is, well, I, it took me to be a billionaire to do that. What's your vote do? Nothing. <laughs> Not a damn thing. All it does in, in your case is it, it gives you something to identify with. It's like, you know, I, I, it's basically, it's like, I identify with this party. Your vote means nothing. Honestly, the registration, it should just be a registration system, which is I register as a Democrat or I res register a Republican. If you want to vote, that's fine. But I, it's really, it's like, fine, red versus blue. Um, you got to remember at the highest level, the number one rule of power has never changed in the history of the world, which is the number one rule of power is stay hidden. Meaning it's the blessing and a curse. If you have a huge amounts of resources, let's say you're the king of whatever, or you're Bilderberg or Rothschilds or Illuminati or whatever, it doesn't really matter. If you're one of these people, the blessing and the curse is, is that you can only be the puppet master. You can't be the puppet master and the puppet. The puppet is in the public eye. And the reason why you can't is the longer version, I think it's the Napoleon version, is uh, he, he said, um, never put yourself in a position where you can be overthrown. Okay. You can't be overthrown if they don't know who you are. So kings can be overthrown. Presidents, dictators, coup d'etats, you can do that all day long. But if they don't know who you are, which is why, when, if you ask any conspiracy guy who the number one player is at the top of the, the pyramid, no one knows. That's how it's supposed to be. It's a council of foreign relations, trilateral, Illuminati. Nobody had the Masons, uh, some Jewish cabal. No one knows. And that's how it's supposed to be. But uh, sorry, back to the political thing. That's why I don't vote because why, why would I? It's, it's, it, I, and I realized that back when I was all, all the way back in university, it, it was, it seemed silly um, at the federal, at state level, local level, fine. You know, you, you do something because you're probably personally tied to them in some way. Uh, but at the federal level, no, no. Trump, seriously, do you really think that uh, that the United States is about to re-elect re re-elect a reality television store as president of the United States? Oh, or here, here, I'll go, I'll go one more, I'll go one more, which is uh, remember the '80s movies? You ever watched you know, the '80s movies back when? We convinced people that the president could actually get up in the middle of the night, open up a briefcase, and launch all the missiles with one click. We told people this for the longest time, and everyone bought it. And now you'd ask people, it's like, well, no, it's not how it works. It's like, no, it's not how it works. But we told them that for years and years and years. <clears throat> it's like, really? We gave Ronald Reagan, like, the button? In fact, that was the joke. It was called the button. And it's like, no, no, they're just spokespeople. That's all they are. They just get up and say their lines and do whatever. And and so, sorry, there you go. Uh, completely unrelated, but how about thoughts on evolution or just theory of evolution in general? Uh, do I think that evolution happens? Yeah, I do. Do I? And but not in the way. I don't think it's a natural process. I don't think it's it's a slow thing that happens over millions of years. I think it is part of the terraforming process. Whoever's building this place, whoever is tinkering with us and the DNA of everything else, they're doing it at a much more accelerated rate. Uh, so yeah, do you change this into this and this into this? Sure. Do I think that monkeys evolved into people? Uh, it's a kind of a, tall, a tough one because then you're going to the whole missing link thing. And we haven't found the missing link. And plus you have things like 2015, they discovered the Billy Ape, which freaked people out because it's a six foot tall chimpanzee that didn't like people at all. So it hid from them. But it's a six foot freaking 
tall chimp. And of course, the other side is, and I know I'm stealing from a comedian, where he said, okay, we evolved from monkeys. So why are there still monkeys? You know, is, it, is this constantly, you know, is this a series of things? We shouldn't have all the monkeys like evolved and then there were no monkeys? But I don't know. I mean, but at the same time, the genetic material of a rhesus monkey, I know, is 90, 94, 96% the same as humans. Could have been tinkering. I don't know. Okay. Uh, how about just in general thoughts on people who believe in the globe model or people who kind of make fun of poke fun at the flat earth model just thoughts on those oh i i'm i'm fine with it uh in fact i get that question i've got i just last week when i was down at the conference i got that question all the time it's like why don't you get mad when globalists come at you i had a, a really rude guy down in a, a media guy down in new zealand his name was uh, guy williams and you could watch the clip on my channel uh, where he just t laying into me i mean just profanity non-stop and and they cut out most of it. He hit me for like 40 minutes. And I said, and, and at the end, he's going, why can't I get you mad? I go, why would I get mad? I go, first off, I used to be you. I was on the other side of the fence. It's like when you say, you know, what are my thoughts on globalists? It's like everybody in my community was, was a globalist. Everybody hated it, including me. In fact, I was one of the more stubborn, pe stubborn people. I hated it for nine months. I would not turn for nine months. Most people take about two weeks now. Right. Women take quicker, um, unless you unless you have a master's degree or higher in any sort of physical science, uh, you will you can turn. Of course, academics turn you know f less than others. Uh, but yeah, I can't. I can't. It'd be hypocritical for like if you came at me, and and I'd be like, I can't yell at you because it's like yeah. I, in fact, I'd come. I go the opposite, and I've done it many times where I said, look, I understand. The question is, what are you mad at? You mad at me? Or are you mad at the topic? It's like, you know, I, I know full, which is why we've never got any true death threats. It's not that people hate the players. They hate the game. They, they hate the idea. And it's like, yeah, I, I, I get it. I did too. It was, it's a journey for any, everybody. And everybody goes through this weird process at the end. But at the end, uh, we can't judge people that are going in. All we do is we kind of look at you and go, okay, you're, you're at this stage. You're at this stage. And I guess, lastly, do you think there's anything else important that I need to know that wasn't in your videos, wasn't any of the questions? Just any overlying thing that I have to know about this? Yeah, don't don't take my word for it. Don't listen to every anything I say and assume that because I have conviction that I am correct. Um, the, th the 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 line that I try to give everybody is do your own research and ask questions. That's how we get into it. The reason why our retention rate is so high is because you didn't get into it because, let's say it's not you, it's the average person on the street. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll say you for now though. You didn't get into it because I convinced you. You got into it because you convinced yourself. In fact, I, I won't even coax you. I, you know, I'm not here to convince you. I'm not even here to persuade you. I'm just here to show you there's something out there that's really weird and interesting and if you want, take a look. But in fact, it's funny. Uh, let me end with this. Um, the first chapter of my book is literally called "Look Away," which I which I just released, uh, and it is is the is a line straight out of Men in Black, which is if sorry, it's a very manly ringtone I have, right? Isn't that nice. <laughs> the uh, I don't know. I just don't like those jarring ringtones, um, which is. Um, if you wake up every day and your life is great, everything is awesome, and you think you got a good beat on things, don't look at it. Don't do it. Because once you go into this, there literally is a point of no return that is straight out of the matrix. It is a red pill, blue th pill thing where you can't go back because there's nothing to go back to. Once you get into this and you tear this down, because you will have to do this yourself. I'm not going to do it for you. Once you tear this down, you can't go back to it because you destroyed it. So even yeah, even if your enthusiasm wanes, it's like, okay, what, you're going to try to you know get duct tape and try to put this thing back together? No one can do it. I mean, which is why we have a higher retention rate than every major religion, every club, everything. It's just a weird, weird, cool thing that I'm just humbled to be a part of. Well, Mark, that's that's all the questions I have. Right on. If 
right. if there's anything else you think I need, but I think that'll be incredibly helpful to what I need to write. Right on. Um, I will, as soon as I hang up, the, uh, the audio file will, br will burn on my side uh, and I will dump it in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the Skype thing. Okay, and perfect. If you, if you need anything else, let me know. All right. Thank you so much. This was super helpful. All right, man. Have a good one. Yeah, have a great night. Bye-bye.